Hey, what's up? Welcome to episode 40 of the Junk Drawer Show. Trying something a little bit different for the intro because uh, in this week's episode, the video file got corrupted. So I went through a decorruption software, something, whatever, and it kind of worked. Not amazing. Um, it was about a two hour podcast that I could only recover about 55 minutes of. So it's it definitely missing some stuff. On top of that, there's these like weird sound glitches at different parts, um, which I was able to edit out as many as I could, but it's not, <laughs> it's not perfect. So I figured while I'm doing a very experimental episode, I might as well try something new with the opening. So normally I record, <clears throat> man, I just went running. Um, <laughs> normally I record, uh, using the same microphone that I use for the podcast, for D&D, whatever. Today I'm just using my phone. So we're gonna see how the phone quality sounds uh, just in my room with no audio, like audio dampening. Um, so this episode was my friend Devin Dowd, who was a beekeeper in upstate, upstate New York, Long Island, in New York, for about uh, five years. Definitely Long Island, not upstate New York. So she was a beekeeper for about five years. And bees have always been something that I have found interesting but knew very little about, aside from that if they sting you, they die. Uh, so I wanted to learn more. I wanted to get the podcast going again because for the past eight episodes, I think, it's been just Justin and I doing um, doing the, <laughs> the movie script writing. So I wanted to get something else. And uh, I, I thought the conversation went really well. It's the first time I've done something in Colorado, actually. Yeah, so I had to set up the switching hands. I had to set up the the table, move stuff around. So it was a little, it was interesting doing that. Um, could definitely do it again. I mean, the great thing about Ikea is that the tables just like come apart super easily. So look forward to more of those in the future, hopefully. And uh, hopefully this one is good to listen to. And if not, sorry about you. I'm actually kind of tired. <laughs> I'm looking at houses all day, I'll do that. I know, that was kind of, well, I don't know. I'm not tired, but I could see how that was like a lot. It's not like tired, it's like not even worn down. I just, my my main energy for the day has been expelled. Mm -hmm. And then this is this is the, the sleep time. Like I was telling you before we started rolling, normally I go to the gym and I'm done around now. So that's when I just... Uh. Do you actually go to sleep when you come back? No, I don't go to sleep, but I, I do like not do as many things wow. so like I, I just i'll watch tv for a little bit before either rating or doing um D, D on tuesdays i'd actually think about it because my, <laughs> my brain is kind of shot i'm like even i know your schedule, schedule. <laughs> <laughs> yeah well okay so hello everyone uh i would have done an intro or i will do an intro before this but uh this is devin devin dowd she's a friend of mine who lives in colorado springs and Found out recently that she was a beekeeper for how long? Uh, like five years. It's like five, oh shit, I thought it was like three years. So that's even more. <laughs> so you're, you're going to have so much to say. And if you don't fill up three hours of content, everyone at home is going to be very disappointed. I'll just leave now. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, so she, she was a beekeeper for five years. And I don't know shit about bees, except for sometimes they sting me and... Um, but, well, actually, I've never got stung no, by a bee. they definitely did not sting you. No, they don't. I got bit by a wasp once, I think. Yeah, they're dicks. Yeah, they're terrible. But, so I wanted to bring her on uh, just to talk about the bees that exist in the world. Um, it's been a long time since I've done a podcast that hasn't been digital. And uh, as you can see, this is not the normal setup. It's not writing Road to Freaks. And I have a blanket right there because otherwise the light from the outside comes through <laughs> and it's really bad. So, hey. Hey. Tell me about bees. Oh, just everything. Okay. Yeah, just every single um, thing about bees. First off, how do you spell it? <laughs> Not how you thought. Yeah. You know? Um, okay, the funniest thing I think about bees is that they're non-native to America. Oh, really? <laughs> yeah. So, like, people brought them over from Europe. And so they're not really like, they are kind of um, like natural to here now. Like they're here and they're not going to leave, but yeah. they were not here originally. So does that cause any sort of issues or do they just adapt? No, they just adapt. 
Huh. It's not like super different climates that they lived in. Um, I mean, there's bees on like every continent except for Antarctica anyway. So, and there's so many different kinds of honeybees that they can live here. Definitely. Huh. Yeah. Well, I, I guess I don't have, I don't eat honey enough either to ever look into it. I mean, even if you did, like I'd say most people that eat honey, don't even, is, they is have the, no idea. Like the history of bees isn't on the back of every honey container. No. Oh. You know what it does have to say though? Ingredients, honey. That's good. Mm -hmm. So is there is there any um, validity to eating local honey when you get used to it to like get used to the uh, allergens? That is what everyone says. I really don't know. Okay. But every but everyone I've talked to and everyone I've sold honey to and people who used to come and buy our honey, that's what they swear by. So they said like once they started eating honey from around their neighborhood and their town that their allergies got better. Huh. Yeah, so I, I did that when I first moved here because someone told me that. I'm like, fuck it. I'll, I'll spend the $10 and see if it works. But I didn't have anything to compare it to, so I don't really know if it did anything. I honestly, I don't have allergies, and I don't like honey. Oh, well, how do so you not I like honey? How are you a beekeeper for five years and you don't like honey? Well, usually I don't tell other beekeepers that because they get really mad, but mm -hmm. like, I just don't like it. I, I find the whole thing more interesting, and I like doing it, and... It's really addicting, but as far as like the honey part goes, like it's not, not for, for you. Me. <laughs> huh. So then, tell tell me about the process of beekeeping, because all I know is the suits. Okay, so yeah, the suits are a big thing. Um, when you're beekeeping, the best time and the part, the time when you're doing the most work is when it's like the hot outside. Really. And meanwhile, you have on this like full length suit. So depending on your hives, you actually don't even have to wear that whole suit. You could just wear like a veil over your face. Mm -hmm. You don't have to wear gloves. Like you don't have to wear the whole thing. But most people do just because at first and for a while it's like pretty nerve wracking when you're holding like a whole frame of bees. Yeah. Um, but basically like what you have to do to get started is find like a reputable apiary. So you find... What, what is it? What's an apiary? An apiary is like a commercial beekeeping operation. Okay. Um, not necessarily like gigantic. Um, the one that we used to use was in Connecticut. They had themselves maybe like 20 hives, but what they did is have a connection to a bigger apiary down south. Okay. Um, so it's very like seasonal for like northern states, and in the south, it's not. So they can kind of make new bees all the time, mm -hmm. and they can sell bees all the time. But people in the north won't buy bees until like March. So basically you find a company or an apiary up here, or in my case, in upstate New York and Long Island, who has a connection to a Southern apiary of bees. Okay. You order your bees ahead of time. Usually they only have a certain amount that you can order, like a certain amount per person, a certain amount in general, they'll be sold out, you know, by February. So you have to like do it over the winter. Mm. And then these will come up on a truck and you have to go there the day they arrive and pick up literally a box of bees. So it's like a box like this big that's screened and inside is 10,000 bees. 10,000? Yeah. That sounds like a prank that you would play on someone. Like, you know those ladybug boxes that you can send to people? No. There are ladybug boxes that you can send to people and just, they just open it up and like ladybugs will fly out. Really? Yeah. I mean, that's what would happen if you open this up. Yeah. So don't do that to the bees. <laughs> well, don't do, do it because you'll lose your money. Yeah. They, do they... cost a... Uh, over a hundred dollars per box for ten thousand bees. Mm -hmm. Seems pretty cheap for bees. Like shipping and everything is only a hundred bucks. Yeah, I mean it's not cheap if you have to buy bees every season. How many bees do you need? Because ten thousand seems like enough. Mm, now your hive cut probably like the average size it's going to be is like three thousand, forty thousand bees. Oh shit. Yeah. Okay. Um, this is just basically the start of it. So you get that box, inside is the queen, everyone in that box is used to that queen smell, so like that's their queen. Mm -hmm. um, however many you're going to do is how many boxes you pick up and you literally take them and drive them to your hives. Um, they can't get out or anything um, and they're just buzzing and it's like, it sounds awesome. <laughs> um, and then once you bring them back, it's like a lot of things are very timed. Like, you can't leave them in that box for so long. They've already traveled for, like, 
hours and hours and they might have been in that box for like a couple days mm -hmm. so there's already like some dead bees in there and you need like a really nice day to happen right around the time when you get your bees to put them in okay so can you can you do it inside like if you have a really bad day and it's storming out could you just be inside a large warehouse you wouldn't want to put them in their hive inside okay. you want to put them in their hive where their hive is gonna stay hopefully but okay. you could keep them, you could keep that box inside for like a day or two, mm -hmm. like if it happened to be raining. Okay. Um, but you don't want to do it for too long because if you lose too many of those bees, it, it, they won't be able to like repopulate. Huh. So how, how do they repopulate? Um, so the queen bee has a certain amount of like eggs that she's going to have like for her whole life. Mm -hmm. um, when you get her, she is not fertilized. So you put everybody in the hive and you have to wait like two weeks because at some point she's going to come out of her little queen box. Like basically she's in a mini cage with a marshmallow <laughs> and okay. they it, will, well, I use marshmallow. Is that just to keep them fed? Like just the queen fed? It's basically to make it so that she comes out slowly. Like she can't, like if I released her right away in the hive, it's possible that maybe they are not totally used to her yet Okay. and they could kill her. So oh shit. I put a little marshmallow and because it's sugar, they will eat it. And by the time they eat the whole thing so she can come out, they're definitely like under her control. Right. <laughs> um, when she gets out, she flies out of the hive and there are like, so there are these little like sex parties in the sky <laughs> that you can't really notice that are basically drones from all over any different hive and they mm -hmm. kind of hang out somewhere in the air. And she will go to that spot and have sex with a bunch of male bees and like kill them all. Like they all die. Oh, they die all for the sex? All the male bees die. <laughs> yeah. They it's like die. a, what is it? The grasshopper? Not grasshopper. Oh. Praying mantis. mantis. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Kind of. Except like. She doesn't bite off their head. No. Like their penis gets stuck in her and then it rips out their guts. Oh, so like the same way that their stinger does? Yeah. Okay. Um, is the stinger their dick? No. Okay. I said to get that out there. <laughs> the ones that'll sting you are all females. Oh, really? Yeah. Okay. So, oh, so there's male and female drones. Drones are only male bees. Okay. Workers are only female bees. And then the only other kind of bee in the hive is the queen bee. So what, what do drones do then? Um, nothing. They, they just... literally are just there to hang out and like eat food and live in the hive and then fly out into those like little pockets of air where they hang out and then have sex with the queen and die. That's their entire life is yeah. to, to fuck off and die. They're literally, um, like if, if you have a bad queen and she's like laying bad eggs, mm -hmm. all those eggs are drones. <laughs> so oh, they're okay. like not, they're not super useful, but they are useful for one thing. Right. Um, so basically she does that and she has sex with a bunch of male bees, comes back to her hive. And then all of her eggs are fertilized, and she will drop one egg per little comb. Like the, the hexagon pocket, honeycomb? Yeah. She'll drop one egg in there, and that like starts the whole process. So is that the same honeycomb that the honey comes out of? Um, well, from one season to the next, it could be. Okay. But like, if she drops an egg, and the frames that have eggs in them won't really have honey on them. Okay. So like where the eggs are is called brood, and that is usually be like you have a frame that's like this big, and mm -hmm. the middle is all brood. It might have some pollen on the outside and maybe a little bit of honey on the outside. Okay. But like further up the hive, after there's enough bees and there's enough like baby making, those will just be just honey. Hmm. It's like kind of hard to picture without like having it here, but like there's different boxes on your hive. Yeah. And the brood is starts at the bottom, and the honey is at the top. Okay. I mean, I've seen the, they're like white houses almost, right? Yes. And then there's each one is almost a drawer, which would have the, kind like the hexagons in it. So each of those boxes, if you took it off and put it down on a table, has, and depending on the kind of hive you have, 10, 8 or 10 of those frames hanging in it. Oh, okay. So it's like an empty box with frames hanging that you would pull up like this one okay. at a time. And so the bottom ones should be filled with babies and like some uh, pollen and some honey. Mm -hmm. And then as there's enough of that, 
and honey season starts, then the top ones will just be filled with honey. So each frame would just be honey on both sides. Okay. So is that is that like hierarchy something the beekeepers orchestrate or do they naturally put the brood at the bottom and move up to the honey? They naturally do it. It's possible that your hive could not do that and maybe your queen is not the best because she's not giving like the right direction. Yeah. But if you ended up with a bunch of honey on the bottom and brood on the next box, the best part is you could literally just take them apart and rearrange them. Right. And make them and put it like in the right position. Do you ever think the queens might just be trying something new? They might be entrepreneurial bees. And they're like, they've been doing it this way for thousands of years, but like, I'm going to change the game. If that was true, they won't get very far <laughs> because the beekeepers are like, don't fucking do that. <laughs> and if your queen is bad, then they will get a new one and kill that queen. So what's bad about having the honey below the brood? Um, in the winter time, the hive kind of makes a little ball and they're all kind of always vibrating and they keep the inside of the hive like warm. Okay. Um, and what they do is basically like eat their way up to the top and by the time they get to the top and like the food is gone, mm -hmm. it's supposed to be like springtime. Oh, so, so they can do it again. So if it was like at the bottom and there was nothing at the top, then like they would end up in an empty box with no food and like it's hard to fix a hive like midwinter. Right, right. So, like, before it goes into winter, you make sure, like, they have what they need in the order that they are going to naturally move into. That makes sense. Okay, so the, the whole honey-making process is just their food stores Oh, yeah, for the no, they're just making it for themselves. Um, they're not making it for us? What rude They don't bees. need all of it. Okay. So do you then have to manage how much you take out so they have enough? Yeah, okay. you do. So if you have a hive and they didn't make enough excess honey, like if you take it, they'll, they're going to die. Okay. So you really have to keep track of how much they have to know how much you can take. Okay. You can also like move things from one to the other. Like there is a lot of moving things around and like, ch like changing the setups to make it better for them. Yeah. They're not always going to naturally be good at it. Yeah. You're kind of just helping the shitty bees live longer. Yeah, like you could have one hive and the queen is awesome and you have a ton of bees, a ton of honey, a ton of brood, everything is great. And one that is like struggling, mm -hmm. and you could take anything you need from that strong hive and you could like put it in the bad hive. So that includes like the brood, so like the babies that are going to come out, um, actual bees, uh, honey, food, whatever. You could move them from one to the other. Oh, so they're not going to like kill each yeah, other? Yeah, no, they will. Oh, they will kill each <laughs> so other. Okay. <laughs> Yeah, when you move them over, if you take frames of honey and move it over, no big deal. You brush all the bees off and you just put a frame that has no bees on it in mm -hmm. the new hive. If you want to take like an amount of bees, like 10,000 bees, and add them to this hive, you have to do it in like a slow manner. And there's a few different ways that you can do it. And one of the ways involves like putting like newspaper in between the old hive and like the new box of bees. Mm -hmm. Because again, it'll take them a while to get through it. Okay. You poke holes in it and the smells will kind of start integrating and they'll smell the queen and then her smells will go into their box and by the time they like rip through the newspaper, they'll be a part of the hive. Like finally used to it. Yeah. Like it's all about that queen's like like pheromone smell that she puts out that okay. controls the workers and tells them what to do, mm -hmm. but also allows other workers to know that those bees are allowed in and not. Gotcha. So how many bees are in a... Was it still called a hive? Yeah. Okay. So how many bees are in, the, in each hive? Like the ones that you would manage? Pro I mean, probably thirty to 40,000. God, that seems like so many. How many bees are in a normal beehive? I've never yeah, seen a yeah. beehive. Now that I say okay, it out well, loud. <laughs> I mean, you could have more. Like if you had... I mean, you only have so much time. My guess would be that people who live in the South where they never have to stop working for winter, mm -hmm. that their hives like start stacking up because like... The more bees you have, the more room you need. So the more bees you have, you have to add boxes. Yeah, and the yeah. more honey they make, you add boxes because otherwise they have nowhere to go and they're stuck. They're going to leave. Right, right. Um, so like the more bees you have, you stack them up probably in the south. They have a lot more than we have because there's only so many they're going to have before it starts getting cold. Yeah. And now it's like not time to make more. It's time to just like stay like, warm yeah, and, and not die. In a circle. Yeah. Yeah, I was thinking... Like just just through the conversation, I realized I've never seen a beehive in person. It's only been in cartoons. So in my head, it's like a little, like, marshmallow oh, man shape. 
Yeah. So I'm like, oh, is that I'm actually how? I what that's called. Is that not a hive? Um, it has a special name though. It's a type of hive. Like, yeah, like the thing that's like this, and it looks like it's made out of like grass, kind of. It's like woven together, like that kind of thing. Yeah, I mean, in the cartoons, it's yellow, but. Mm -hmm. So that has like a certain name that I'm totally forgetting right now. Beehive. Um, but that's not like. I think people use that like hundreds of years ago, but like, that's not a thing. I thought that was just what they naturally made. Oh no. Um, What's their natural hive like? They don't make an outside to the hive. They put their hive in empty spaces. Oh, okay. So... Here, like pull a pull hollow, that a little bit closer to you. Like a hollow tree. Mm -hmm. um, you know, if, if, if they started making a hive off of this soda, there would be no exterior of it. You would just see the comb. So they find a good spot that's hidden somewhere. That's why you could end up with like bees in your wall. Right. Or in a right. tree. Because they just make the comb out of wax. They don't make any kind of exterior thing. Oh, that makes so much sense. Because it, it does like in the movie in the in cartoons when bears get at them, they're just like hanging from a a, a branch. And that's such a so bad engineering choice that from the bees' perspective. Be. I mean, there's some things that are kinda like that now. Um, mm -hmm. because when your bees uh maybe don't have enough space or the queen is bad or it's too hot or like any number of things your beehive can swarm so the whole colony will leave and basically what happens is like um all of a sudden you are in like a tornado of bees uh -huh. and then they will land somewhere and they basically are looking for a new home um and so what people do is they put like swarm catches like a swarm trap okay. in a tree so it seems like a good home for a swarm to come so just by chance, if a swarm of bees is looking for a home and here is this perfect little home, they'll go in there and the beekeeper, you just got like free bees. Oh, okay. <laughs> so, the... so it's kind of accurate. Like maybe they did used to use those um, kinds of hives, which I will never remember the name of, and put them in trees because it would be a way to have a hive that you could go and check on to if they stay in there. Right. Like to basically catch a, not wild, but like basically a wild colony. Yeah. It's crazy how much, uh, at least me, that I picked up from cartoons and like kid shows. That in my head, I'm like, this is how this is reality. Like dogs don't like cats. I have actually never seen a dog chase a cat. Everyone that I know that has a dog and a cat, they get along super well. Yeah. And it's stuff like that, or the bees, or I don't know. I mean, it's not often that you come across like a beehive that's that you could like walk up to. No, you but know? I, so that's understandable. Yeah, it's just funny to me, like the fact that. There's all this knowledge that I have from cartoons that I just treat as reality, and it isn't necessarily real. Like, I can't paint a tunnel on a rock and go through it. I tried. It didn't work. <laughs> That's why I got this scar. That's not true. Yeah. That's interesting. So I have a question uh, specifically because Jordan is vegan, and you, you know him. Mm -hmm. So I think the argument from the vegan side about not eating honey is that you're taking... You're, you're, you're harming their livelihood. You're taking something from them, which you, you are. You're taking their food. But if you leave enough that they survive, where do you, where do you expand upon that? Okay. Um, so my thoughts on it as being like not vegan and only wanting to help bees mm -hmm. um, is that if you have a hive and you never take any honey out of it, the bees could be totally fine. They could be not fine. Like they do require if you want honey production and to sell it human intervention mm -hmm. like bees could live in a tree and be completely fine forever and just that colony could live there for years and years like people could have a colony in the wall of their house for like 30 years and it'll be fine okay. and no human has ever interfered with it given it any kind of like medication or fed it extra or anything like that and it'll be fine um but to even sell honey you really do have to kind of like intervene um with a hive so if you are a smart beekeeper you're not going to take too much from the bees or they'll die and then you have to spend money again in the spring mm -hmm. so i don't feel like it's bad to take the extra honey um the bees don't you're not like hurting them beekeepers are very careful when dealing with their bees um i know for me like if even if i accidentally smush one like i feel bad yeah like, when i have to switch a queen and i have to kill it it's like i'm literally like i'm so sorry you know like <laughs> Ugh. and i mean and that's like one bee out of like forty thousand bees so yeah um 
it won't hurt the hive, it won't hurt them to take honey from them. Um, but I guess if the argument is like, just leave them alone, you but know. <laughs> it seems like, I mean, from what you've been saying, there are a lot of bad queens. It seems like by intervening, you're making those 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 hives that would be that would fail because of the bad leadership you're kind of fixing that so that they can live oh yeah you're definitely um i mean you're helping like literally like the world by continuing your beehive like keeping it alive season to season you're helping everything around it yeah um maybe just that one bad queen that you have to kill right um oh so you do have to kill a bad queen it's not like they learn over time Oh no, yeah. If she's not good, you gotta kill her. So, um, so do you take, like, do you wait for her to like spawn another queen? Um, so, well, okay. So the way queens are made, um, the way that like a beekeeper would do it, or most of them, I would say, is that you literally order a queen. Okay. And so, or when you get your package of bees, it has a queen in it, and hopefully, this place that you get from is reputable. Like, bees have different kinds of bees have different temperaments. Um, different honey production, like all kinds of things. So you hopefully, they know they've been breeding other good queens. Okay. So the queens that you put in, basically once you start, you have a queen in there. If she's bad, you want to have your other queen, find that queen, which is hard enough, mm -hmm. take her out, kill her, put the other queen in, same thing like with that marshmallow. So it takes a while for her to come out and... By the time she comes out, her she now controls everybody because of okay. her smells. If for some reason your queen died, like could, went out to go do her flight mm -hmm. and like got eaten by a bird or like you accidentally smushed her or she just died in your hive and you didn't know, the hive will make a new queen. Okay. Except that like that queen is not going to be as good as these specifically bred queens that you get from beekeepers. Okay. Because they're taking a hive that they know is good, mm -hmm. and they're breeding that queen specifically. How, so do, how do they do that? Um, they Queens are made by being fed um, this thing called royal jelly, mm -hmm. which is like a something that bees like make. Okay. And so they will like feed the queen bee that this, like say that this little egg is the one that is going to be the queen. They'll feed her that like her whole life. And that will make her become a queen instead of a worker bee. Oh, so it's all like there are they it's all like the same egg. They're all born the same, and then depending on what they eat determines what they become. For the queen and the worker, yes. Oh, but right, because drones are the drone nice. is like an unfertilized um, egg. Okay. So like I think there's something that has to do with like the drones only have like one chromosome and the workers have two. Okay. So it's like an unfertilized egg that is going to turn into a drone bee. Mm -hmm. She goes out, does her flight, and they're fertile. She's making worker bees. The worker bees, some of them have different jobs, and one of the jobs is to take care of, they're called nurse bees, and they take care of, like, the eggs and, like, the larvae. Okay. And they feed them. And so if they're deciding, like, the hive knows we don't have a queen and we need one, they'll start making them. And they might make, like, a bunch of cells of queens, and they're feeding all of them royal jelly, and they're all going to be queens. Whichever one comes out first is going to kill the other ones because they know that they're queens. Yeah, yeah. They rule now, except that you don't know if that's going to be a good queen or not. Because it was right. made by the workers. It wasn't made by a person who was like, this hive has good honey production and is super nice and calm and, you know, survived over the winter and, like, that's a good queen. It's like a, just a roll of the dice kind of. Yeah. So for – have you ever done any queen uh, breeding? No. Do you know how it works? It's along the lines of um, taking, like, literally, like, say that you have a queen that's good, um, and they're laying eggs. You are literally, like, cutting out that honeycomb, and, like, and, like you're bringing it, you're probably doing it in, like, your garage, mm -hmm. and you may have a bunch, and you're, like, I think they put the food in. I can't remember if it's, like, they do it or they let the nurse bees do it. Okay. But basically, they have, like, little tubes that are queens, and the person monitors them. And actually feed them the royal jelly? I think they feed them that. Because I, everything I've seen, there's never any other bees around. It's just, like, a person with, like, a dropper, mm -hmm. and they're also, like, using, like, very little, like, because everything is so small, so it's, like, they're using, like, little kind of toothpick things to, like, move larva over and stuff like that. 
I don't know if that's going to stop recording, okay. so I'm just going to... You can keep talking. That's all I know about that, I think. <laughs> I think it's still going. Yeah, it's still going. I might cut that out, I might not. We'll see. Okay. Um, yeah, that's super interesting. Because I imagine, like, for, I feel like for ever since high school, I've been hearing that, that bees are, are going extinct and, like, our cell phone signals are messing up their flight patterns and, and that type of thing. So I, I just... Like, I'm very interested in the things that we can do and the things that we do do to, to kind of help them. Well, I think that, I mean, the best thing you could probably do is just to keep bees. Mm -hmm. um, keep bees. Um, and honestly, one of the easiest things that a regular person can do is just, like, not cut down their dandelions. That bloom is, like, the first kind of thing that comes up. Um, in a lot of parts of the country, that is, like, the first food source for bees okay. is, like, dandelions and things like that. So having, like, flowers, like, on your property and or growing vegetables and things like that, mm -hmm. all of that helps bees anyway, even if you didn't want to keep bees. Okay. As far as, like, power lines and things like that, I don't think we're having a lot of luck with, like, solidifying what is hurting them or not. Like, yeah. there's a lot of thought that, like, certain pesticides are hurting them. And yeah, pesticides like hurt bugs in general, but like, are there certain things that we shouldn't use at all because of specifically for bees? Yeah. Um, none of that is super fact yet. Right. My understanding was that because they like navigate through electromagnetic signals that having the power lines like warps that for them. Also, I'm an idiot, so I don't <laughs> know what I'm talking about, but that sounds like something I've heard. I mean... I have I don't I, I don't know honestly don't know because from what I've learned about like bees finding flowers specifically is that they kind of, they talk to each other and mm -hmm. tell them where to go to find um, what they're looking for right and they know in this kind of directional sense of how to get exactly back to their hive okay so I haven't really heard too much about like electromagnetic anything yeah and i don't want to like put you on the spot as someone who's not a bee scientist yeah. you know like you you kept bees but it doesn't mean you dove into the, the i don't literature. have like a college degree in bees. <laughs> in bees yeah okay i have a degree from the streets so. oh damn mm -hmm. so you got that gold tooth right <laughs> that's great though you're you thugging. can't see it yeah i know that's how i'm just i'm gonna pretend i mean you set the picture it looks it looks good it's very it's so shiny <laughs> it is very shiny so for for the bee thing, so having like a garden, like a, a little garden in your backyard, would help that. <clears throat> letting the the grass and everything be just what it is. Oh yeah, um, I mean bees travel very far away from their hives looking for food, um, but the more food there is, then the more honey there's going to be. The more like pollinating they're doing naturally. Yeah. Um, so any of that is helpful. Like if you had bees and and within two miles of you was just like dirt. I mean, they're going to have a hard time. Right. Um, you can feed your bees. You can feed them sugar, things like that. But the honey content is not going to be, like, quality will not be as good. Right. Um, and then it's not pollinating anything. So it's not really helping us or the planet in general. Right, right. You're just giving them sugar water. It's yeah. like when we just drink sugar water. We're not getting anything out yeah, of this. Yeah, like, from this is not helping pressure. anything. Yeah. <laughs> I'll still drink it, but... It's like, damn, it tastes good, though. <laughs> exactly. Like, they'll... That's why they eat the marshmallow. Um, there's... Over the winter, depending on where you are, you may have to feed your bees just to make them... Just to let them get through the winter. Mm -hmm. um, if they didn't have enough honey, you may have to feed them. But realistically, from spring to, like, October, November, you want them just having nectar from plants. Right. Fuck, I had something. It was something with, oh, with the bees. When, when they, you said they just vibrate in a giant ball, right? Yeah. Is that to warm the hive or are they warming inside and the outside just like die off? Um, well, so by the time they get to that stage, like bees are not leaving the hive anymore. Okay. So everybody's in there. They're keeping the inside, which is like completely sealed basically by winter time. Um, very like, kind of like moist and warm. Mm -hmm. Um, and that's the only way that they're going to live. So, like, if you were, you could, and beekeepers do this, they have, like, those heat sensor cameras. Okay. And they check their hives. And so you can literally check it and see how it's cold outside, and then you'll see, like, their ball of bees. Oh, being, really? Like, and I want to say it's, like, around 70 degrees. Like, don't quote me on that. But it's, like, it is warm yeah. in there for them to survive. Okay. So they, like have to stay like that queen like right in the middle right you know, right like, it's all like protect her right because if the drones die whatever but like it can snow on your hive like you might want to clean it off but like um in the winter time 
I like to, I block off um, the entrance to the hive. I leave like a little tiny space because you don't want like airflow. Like mm -hmm. you don't want it to be super wet in there. Right. Um, because it will grow like mold and kill them. Um, but you need like some airflow. So there's little tricks that you can do. Like you can have the cover be up a little bit. Like sometimes I put little rocks in there so that there is like an airflow that's going to go through the whole hive and like out the front and up the top kind mm -hmm. of a thing. Um, but they will use, um, it's like sap from trees and like seal up the whole inside. Really? So like they'll, they'll make sure, they'll try to make sure there's no airflow? They just make sure that like everything is sealed so like intruders can't come in. Mm -hmm. They still need to go in and out so like they won't close up the big holes or anything. Okay. But like in between the boxes get sealed. So gotcha. like when you go to open one, there's tools that you have where you literally have to stick it in huh. between two boxes and crack it open. Oh, that's wild. Because it's like so sticky and stuck. Yeah. And, if, and it's not like called sap when they're doing it and I can't remember the name of it, but like it's just this like super sticky brown stuff that they like glue everything with. But is that made from tree sap? I think it is. Okay. This is like something that I haven't thought about in a while and like haven't explained to anybody in a long time. Yeah. It's like, I know it's there and I deal with it, but. When, when did you stop beekeeping? Was that when you left the farm? Yeah. So that's like uh, two years ago. Yeah. So your knowledge is all like buried deep down and it's... I'm asking you to just <laughs> blindly go in there and pull it out. Yeah. And plus like um, the way that I was beekeeping was I did it for work and mm. I did it because I loved it doing for work. Um, but I, some people, well, one, some people that's their only job and some people are very sciencey about it. Some people are very natural about it. Um, there's a few different ways you can go. Like there's people who love all of the newest, like kind of technology. Um, there's a lot of complication when you get into like medicating your hive because there are things like mites and bugs that and like diseases that these can get mm -hmm. that will kill your hive. So there's people that are super into that. And that I've never dove into. Okay. So all of my hives were basically like natural, you could say. Mm -hmm. um, but then again, like a lot of people have a lot of hives die over, die over the winter. So there was, when I was doing this a few years ago, I think the average was that 30% of your hives survived the winter. That's it? Wow. Is that is that similar to what you'd see in nature? Um, Do you know? I don't know. And I kind of want to say no. Um, that seems really low. It is really low. Uh, that's what kind of started um, this whole, like, you know, like, you heard of, like, CCD, colony collapse disorder? Yeah, yeah. Um, so that's, it's kind of not a thing so much anymore that people are worried about. Okay. But at some point, a few years ago, same thing, only 30% of, like, hives were surviving. Mm -hmm. And people were, like, really confused. And, um... And also the hives were, the way that they were finding the hives was weird. So you could go to your hive, it's dead. Literally every single bee is dead. Mm -hmm. And they're just on the bottom of the box dead. And you can figure out by looking at them kind of what killed them. Okay. But with colony collapse disorder, people were realizing like they, they were losing hives. And weirdly enough, they'd have like, I think it was like the queen and some bees and most of the bees were gone. Hmm. Which is strange for bees to leave without their queen. Right. So, like, that was very confusing. I thought that's what a swarm was. If oh, the... no, the queen goes. She tells them, like, we're going. Oh, I thought it was when the queen was doing a bad job. It was when they would, like, dip out. I mean, they could. Because, she, well, obviously, she's doing bad because she's like, we're leaving. Like, we're going. And that's not what you want. You're hiding. Oh, I gotcha. Okay. But sometimes it could be because, like, there's too many bees and not enough space. So mm -hmm. they're like, we need to find a new home. Okay. Um, but this, like, colony collapse disorder was kind of simultaneous with, like, people losing their hives anyway and, like, the bees dying. Mm -hmm. And... I, everyone was trying to figure out like what the deal was and there wasn't really a clear answer to it but either way like around 30 percent was kind of average for the people i knew so in my like local club and um i went to some like super cool like beekeeping conferences mm -hmm. and <laughs> everyone there same kind of consensus was like they were losing like 30 to fit um they were keeping like 30 to 50 percent of their hives wow. over the winter it, it was a lot of that to do with you being so far up north i mean that's what i figured because it was just so hard to keep them alive over the winter mm -hmm. because um but just the food stores that they had um coldness dampness like it just i thought it was difficult because also i mean 
I don't want to say probably in my case it was my fault because because I was also like running a business I couldn't right. tend to them as much as other people probably could have mm -hmm. but that I mean they weren't dying in the summer so it was <laughs> right. like that leads me to believe that like the winter is the biggest problem yeah can you do people heat it in, in, in really cold climates is there like a space heater that people will, will use I haven't seen that but there's a lot of different like things that people will do so they'll like wrap their hives in that I think it's like black roofing paper mm -hmm. um, just to try and get as much heat like absorbed into it as possible or to keep it in like right. they'll insulate their the outside of the hives with like styrofoam um, they'll, people try everything just to keep it as warm as possible right so do, is there like a too hot point for bees I imagine there would have to be like catching on fire would be too hot but I mean Probably. I never seen it, so I couldn't say 100% sure it wouldn't work or something, right. but yeah, no, um, if they get too hot, I mean, I haven't, like the best time for them is when it's hot, because if it's super hot, there's not a lot of bees inside. Like they're out finding nectar. Right. So if, I like, was, nice I just... weather, they're all out. If it was like 100 degrees in the middle of the night, maybe? Right. That's what I was thinking of is somewhere in like Arizona where it just gets incredibly hot like in the middle of the day yeah even when it's like 120 they're not something. in they honestly they are not probably affected by that at all no. and they're not even in the hive like most of the bees will be out about the whole day in and out um so i've never like seen that as a problem well that's good i guess global warming's fine then <laughs> it's fine for them yeah the bees will be okay they'll take over they'll start getting human level intelligence and then we will be their dinosaurs so we'll be collecting the nectar for them no, we'll all be dead. We'll be their fossil fuels. <laughs> oh, there you go. Yeah, unless, like, everywhere that keeps bees goes underwater, and then all those bees drown. Mm hmm I mean, they're not going to drown right away. They can kind of swim around, like, in water. For, like, a decent amount of time? Like, sometimes what I would do if I was harvesting honey, and then a bee would, like, fall in and get covered in honey i'd take her out and like drop water on her or just kind of put her in a little puddle of water so she can get like cleaned off uh -huh. so like i mean they will drown sometimes but like people put out like a bowl of water with like rocks in it or marbles in it so they kind of can sit on something and drink water and huh. so they can kind of be around it like if you have a swimming pool if someone has bees next door like bees would probably be right around the top of the water like drinking yeah now that you say that i've had at, at various homes when I was growing up, we had pools, and I remember in the summer swimming and there being bees, and me kind of freaking out, my younger brother definitely freaking out, because he, he's four years younger than me. So if I was 10, he was like six, yeah. and he did get stung by a bee, like at a pretty young age. So he's always been afraid of things that fly yeah. a lot. I think everybody was like, until you really fully understand the difference between like a honeybee and a yellow jacket or a wasp or something, you just assume like everything that's flying that's like yellowish is a bee yeah yeah <laughs> um so they get a bad rap like i always try to be like if someone's like ah it's a bee and if it's not i'm like it is not a bee <laughs> yeah i mean i saw you earlier today just like or i've seen a couple times there's just a bee flying around you're like oh hey what's up little guy and trying to play with him basically yeah. my brother says i'm like a creepy bee lady because like at any time i would be like holding bees in my hand um because they really don't want to hurt you like ever really um but like if you see a honeybee on a flower it's not really gonna land on you because it's like it's busy mm -hmm. and yeah. but you could put your hand right up to it you could touch it it's not gonna like attack you um they're really like their um attacking mode is really self-defense of the hive right so that's why people will dress up when they're opening a hive because some hives are just mean yeah um but they go into protect mode, they're protecting the queen, protecting the food, protecting each other. So that's most likely when you're gonna get stung. But honestly, the only times I've gotten stung are when I did something really like fucking stupid. Like what? Like I was like, you know what? I just really quick just gotta check this one thing in the hive and I'm just gonna go over without my suit on and like check something and like open it. Or like, you know, you're holding something, you fucking drop it, which has happened Ooh. before, like things like that. Um, that is always the time it has happened to me, right? I'm like, I don't want to go back in, put on my whole suit, get all my stuff, go out to the bee field. Like, I'm, I just real quick just want to, like, put in a new, you know, like, um, little tiny, like, container of sugar water. Mm -hmm. um, I'm just going to change it real quick, and then I think I can just do that without my suit on. Because as soon as I crack that thing, 
they are like on alert. Right. Or I'm just like, oh, I'm not going to smoke them. I'm, I'll just do it real quick. Smoke them to like get them out of a certain area? Um, kind of. The smoke, I've heard a lot of people have a lot of different opinions about what the smoke actually does, but either way, the smoke like helps the beekeeper. Okay. <laughs> because whether or not it's, um, basically the smoke is like freaking them out. So what they're doing is like they're busy like, um, eating as much honey as they can to like leave with it. Okay. Um, and they're like getting ready to leave. So they're not paying attention to you or you're just, you're like dazing them with the smoke. And so they kind of are like, oh, I don't know what's going on. Like I've heard people argue back and forth, like which way it is. Mm -hmm. And I don't know which way it is, but it certainly helps you when you're doing stuff. Right. So they, so if their hive is under attack and they're not like defending outright, they'll eat the honey even then come back. Well, Probably not, but like okay. the smoke, I guess, gives them the thought like, we may need to leave. Like they're not going to leave. Okay. You could be working in there and smoke them a few times. Like they're not going to leave, but maybe it just like makes them think that like there's a fire and like we have to go. Right. But like, no. So that's why I don't know like which way it is. Like yeah. is the smoke dazing them or is it making them preoccupied? I don't know, but either way, like, and you're not spending like an hour in your hive. Like, like a couple it's minutes. supposed to be quick like you don't want to have it open forever mm -hmm. other bees can come in predator you know right. yellow jackets things like that um it could start raining like you don't you don't want to have your hive open for an hour right you're trying to be as quick as possible so by the time you're smoking them you know for like 30 seconds and then doing your work like they're not leaving okay and you mentioned earlier that like mites and things can get inside and that kind of ruins the hive what is their defense mechanism do they just sting and try to kill it so okay these are really cool for the mites they can do nothing these are like extra like they're not microscopic because you can see them with your naked eye but they're just like on the bees themselves oh okay. this thing called varroa mites which is like a huge problem almost everywhere in the entire world and like it just started somewhere and then it spread to like everyone's bees everywhere yeah um and people think that's a huge cause of losing hives um and there's all sorts of things that you can do for that and medication you can give your hive and but it's like an ongoing struggle mm -hmm. um for other things that live in the hive which are like all sorts of things so there can, there's like hive beetles okay they don't really do anything they're obnoxious they don't like poison the honey or anything but there's these little black beetles that are around um if the bees catch them like they'll drive them like they drive them out kind of okay. so those they'll chase you can literally be like watching them like chase <laughs> this beetle around the hive um spiders oh yeah sometimes you open a hive and there is a creepy ass spider in there one time i opened my hive and i saw this creepy gray hairy little spider and it had a bee in its mouth oh yeah that's right they eat bugs <sighs> that was like traumatizing when i see a spider in my hive i fucking kill it yeah do they do they do webs in there too or are they just in there and like, fuck, I'll eat this bee? A lot of times I turn over the outer cover and I'll see like, you know, like that the little white where like the spider egg is. You know what I'm talking about? Yeah, yeah. It's just like a, I don't know. It almost looks like a Spider-Man. like a nest or something or whatever. Yeah, but it looks like when Spider-Man does his web and yes. hits a bad guy. So if I see that, I will Squash it. smash it because that bee, that spider is going to come out and it could be a spider that eats bees. Right. Um, um. Other little bugs and stuff will find their ways in there like earwigs and like random stuff because like you're also probably doing it in the middle of like a field mm -hmm. um and it has it's on a stand so it's like things from the ground can crawl up and get in there right. and if it's not really like a bee the bees are not probably like too concerned about getting them out a little like grasshopper things like some random stuff like that mm -hmm. over the winter you another reason why you close it up is because you can get mice that like hang out in there because it's warm okay. yeah <laughs> and they okay. kind of hang out in your hive um sometimes you get that but um so they will do that uh they will fight yellow jackets um the idea is probably one-on-one -on -one, a yellow jacket versus a honeybee a yellow jacket's gonna win right like it can attack more than once and they are meat eaters um, oh really they're carnivores i did not know that oh they will eat bees um sure. yellow jackets like wasps um, so multiple honeybees can kill that yellow jacket. One of right. the things they do is like kind of suffocate it. Okay. Um, they'll fight them out of the hive, literally just like push them out. Um, I've seen that before. If I see yellow jackets trying to go into the hive, I'll kill them. Oh, it's like right. they're in the ground. 
below the hive, basically. I mean, that's why they look like they do. Like, that's why yellow jackets are striped. To look like bees? Yeah, so they can, like, sneak their way sneak in. in. Okay. When they suffocate it, do they do the ball like they do to keep warm? Yeah, kind of. Oh, that's Like, cool. they'll kind of, like, enclose them and then, like, heat them up. Slash so they cook him. him. Kind of. And then they eat him. Like, there was that cool video that was on the internet where a bunch of honeybees on, like, a big-ass hornet, and, like, they all, like, went over it, and they were just, like, you know, they're, like, moving and flapping their wings and vibrating and yeah. like, covering it and literally, like, heated up so much that it died. That's insane. I don't think I've yeah. seen that video. This is why I needed Jamie to just, like, pull stuff up for me. <laughs> yeah. God. These are badass. They are. Do they sleep? They're or how much do they sleep? They have to sleep, right? Um, I don't. I want to say they don't sleep at all. I don't know. I want to say no. Like, I mean, I don't think they have the um, like body function to go through a cycle like that, where they're like awake and asleep. They just like chill out, is what I want to say. So it's more like a like a hibernation. Yeah. Like, like a bear would do? Like in this, like in the peak season, they'll only live like six weeks. Like five, six weeks. In oh. the winter, they'll live like six months. Four to six months. Because they just like slow it down. Like, oh. yeah, they're vibrating to keep warm, but like they're not going out and flying. Like they can live longer. Right. I, I didn't even think about that. I want to say no to the sleeping thing. I never looked that up, but I just... Huh. Like, for some reason, in my head, these bees are like people where they just live for a really long time. And like, all right, this is the honey season. But no, no it's like they just live for six weeks. And they're like, all right, peace out. That's why you, they always have to be making new bees. Like, that's why you need a new queen. Because, like, you need an new bees. Otherwise, like, the hive will die. Do queens also only live six weeks? No. They can live for, I would say, years, I guess. Um, their good laying time is, like, one year. Laying time? Like all the good eggs that are going to come out come out in probably a year oh okay and then bad ones might start coming out or unfertilized eggs might start coming out or right she is now old after one year so then after that year it's it's like more a, drones than it would be yeah like that workers. could that could start happening okay um it might not it, she could be fine for two years um but a lot of times beekeepers will automatically requeen in one year Okay, just to make sure that the... Just to make sure you don't get midsummer and all of a sudden you got her laying drones. Yeah. Because the less worker bees that you have coming in, like the less chance you have to survive. Yeah. I wonder how that's contributing to the issue. Because I imagine if you if every bee or if every queen bee at a year, you're just swapping them out. You're like creating this artificial environmental pressure to... What's what's the word? It's not environmental pressure, but basically you're you're incentivizing the the bee to only be viable for a year. Oh, like because we switch them for one year, they're only good for one year. Yeah, like eventually, because <laughs> you, you just you're never gonna find one that could just reproduce for like two or three years, because then that would create ones that would likely create for two or three years, and and those would be more viable than a, a one year producer. I'm thinking that if a beekeeper, like like a person who has an apiary who sells bees, mm -hmm. has good queens that have lasted him two or three years he will market and sell those as like this queen will last you two to three years oh okay that's fair like they wouldn't just not if they had that like if i had that i'd be like i would tell other beekeepers like i have a queen who is laying good for two three years oh, okay okay and so, then so... you would and then that probably would become a thing but it's i think it's just their physical capabilities that just i just don't think that most of them do right so Chances are you're probably getting like one year. One year. And then you just have to kill that one and bring in a new one. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Bye bye. I should little... say sorry before you. Oh, yeah. Do a little funeral rite for it. Session. Just talk about its life. Think about all the, the honey it's helped produce. I know. I probably give them more feelings than they actually have. Yeah. <laughs> I imagine they don't have like any feelings. No. It's really, I mean, they are super smart, but it's kind of, um, it literally is kind of probably like a cartoon. Like the queen is telling them what to do and like that's what they do. Mm -hmm. So they're not thinking for themselves unless there's no queen. Then they all decide that they need to make some. But they're not, you know, they don't come across a dead bee from their hive and like... Care. Yeah. Like, there's, there's no funeral <laughs> procession. There's a video that's driving me insane, but it's... I, don't, I wouldn't like want to ruin it because it's like kind of cute mm -hmm. of like a bee that is covered in honey. So maybe like... 
when you're harvesting honey, some bees fall in or whatever, and it's in the front of a hive, and other bees are, like, cleaning off, and, like, the caption is, like, oh, these bees are, like, helping their friend, and I'm, like, no, they, they're, like, they smell honey, like, they're, they're eating, they're eating the honey, <laughs> I mean, it's gonna help their friend, yeah, but they're not, like, oh, my friend, <laughs> yeah, they're, like, oh, food for me, yeah, yeah, that, that's a funny thing humans do, is we, like, personify everything, like, oh, they're just like us, when, like, not really. Yeah, and I do that constantly. Oh, yeah. But like they're so like, cute. I mean, they are cute bees. They have little straw tongues, like, you know? It's like like Yoshi, just... Yeah, like, if you had a bit of honey on your finger with a bee there, you would see her little, like, tongue come out and, like, eat it. <laughs> That's funny. I can't picture that, like... Oh, I have a picture of it on my do phone. You? Yeah. Do you have your phone on you? It's right there. That's so far away. Do you want to see Yeah, pull it up. Okay. Grab it. <laughs> Yeah, because like to me, bees have always just been this like this thing that I don't think about. I'm like, okay, they could sting me, but otherwise they're they're great for us. Like they pollinate everything, they make hives, they I don't know, bears don't like them, or bears like them. Uh, bears just... is a huge problem for beekeepers. Oh shit! Yeah, bears I mean... bears is a huge problem. Bears are a huge problem for beekeepers. Yeah, I didn't. Yeah, I guess I would. Oh what do you God, do there's... for that? <laughs> okay, so do you have like an armed guard? People put, like, electric fences around their beehives. I can't imagine a bear would give a shit about that. I mean, I've seen a lot of pictures of people's hives complete. Toppled over, opened up. I mean, they put fences. They put electric fences. They put cameras. They have, like, I don't want to say barbed wire, but, like, wire stuff around it. Like, I mean, bears is a huge problem. Other kind of, probably, like, like raccoons and things like that will also, yeah. if they had the chance to get in a hive, they would. I bet. I mean, my biggest problem that I had was, like, the wind, like, wind knocking the cover over, um, so I put, like, rocks on the top of it just to help with that. I've had people cutting trees near my hives, and, um, so here's a, here is a picture of me, um, in my suit, just kind of, uh, probably installing a hive, and that's, yeah. like, my little tool belt that I have, all kinds of, like, tool belts and aprons, because you have a lot of different, like, things on you. You have, like, a lighter your hive tools. Um, I usually have some like marshmallows or some like fuel for the smoker. So mm -hmm. usually some sort of kind of tool belt or a little like wagon or something you need. Yeah. So I see what you're saying about how it's, it's just a drawer with a bunch of like slats. It's literally just a square. I mean, you can make them your own, yourself. I think it's kind of difficult and probably too annoying to do, but I have my first ever hive. I decided to go pretty legit and put the foundation in the frames myself uh -huh. so it's hard not to picture but like each of those things that goes in the box is called a frame okay and that is basically just a rectangle of wood and in the middle of it is foundation and that's what the high the bees build the comb off of so to help okay. them it's all little honeycomb hexagon shapes mm -hmm. that is already raised a little bit and they can just drop the wax on it and it will speed up the process getting, because they can't make any honey until they draw that comb out right um so that's like the first part unless you have but after a few years like you have it it's already drawn out so they don't have to waste time doing that right so they'll just reuse the same combs over oh, yeah. and over but i decided that i was gonna like be really legit and i took um this like wax foundation with these wires and you have to like 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 nail them in staple them and you put this like very fragile stuff and i just it was so such a process and i just thought next time i'm just doing plastic <laughs> yeah i can almost see can the you kind of see it yeah it's probably taken on like an iphone 6 or something so no but once you zoom in a little bit you see the like their little tongue yeah a little tongue just going at it yeah that's wild yeah, these are so much more involved than i really thought about yeah and, and once you see them up close like that i mean they're fuzzy you know, they're not super bright yellow like uh, yellow jackets are, and that's how you...